When working on a software project, there are a few things that become really painful to do if we just manage all the files of our project manually. The first is just keeping backups so we don't lose our work, but beyond that we also want the ability to track and revert any changes we make. So we go through different release cycles of our software and we make changes, we fix bugs and so forth, and it'd be really nice if we could, uh, when we need to, go back and look at old code. Or if we somehow introduce a new bug into our code, we want the ability to revert back to some earlier version that didn't have that bug. Manually managing all the files also really makes it painful to do just basic synchronization, that is synchronizing with other people. When you have many people working together on the same project, things get ugly really fast if everyone has to manually send all their changes to everyone else. And one thing that makes nearly impossible is keeping track of who really is responsible for what changes, tracking the so-called ownership for the code, aka the blame for the code. Who wrote this line of code? When did they write it? Why did they write it? That's all stuff you very often want to know. And finally, if we're manually managing all the files in our project, that makes it difficult to do what's called branching. That is, to take your work and split it off into different lines of development. So in this branch, we're working on this feature, and in this other branch, we're just fixing bugs. And when the feature is done and is ready, we'll at some point then merge the two branches together, effectively integrating the new feature and all those bug fixes together into one version of the code. So, making backups, tracking and reverting changes, synchronizing, tracking ownership branching, doing all these things manually is extremely ugly and error prone. So instead, programmers use software tools called version control systems, which are so called, of course, because mainly what they're about is tracking the changes to the files and directories in our projects. In the terminology of version control, we have what is called the working directory or the working copy or the working set. I'll usually say working directory. Um, which is simply the directory which is being tracked by the version control system. It's the directory which contains all the files of our project, and it's called the working directory because it's where we do our work. We go in there, we create new files, we delete files, and we edit files, and then having done a few hours worth or a day's worth or a couple days worth of work, um, good practice then is to take a snapshot of our working directory to record a version or revision of our project. And these revisions, these snapshots, they get stored in what's called the repository, once a version is checked in, as we say, to our repository, we can come back later and check out that version, that revision. And what that means is to copy the revision from the repository back into our working directory. So be clear that the version control system doesn't take a continuous history of our changes. It doesn't watch us as we work and record every single little thing we do. We have to manually check in a new snapshot. We have to make new revisions in the repository. But if we do this on a regular basis, then uh, that's generally good enough. We can go back and uh, work with our older revisions. Now, there are many different version control systems out there, but they generally fall into two broad categories. Most of the older version control systems are centralized, meaning that in the typical workflow, everyone working on the project has their own working directory, but they all synchronize their work through a central repository on a server. In contrast, most newer version control systems are distributed, meaning that everyone has their own working directory, but then they also each have their own repository. And the snapshots, the revisions created in these local repositories get pushed and pulled, meaning sent and requested, from one repository directly to another. So Andrew, working in his working directory, uh, checks in his changes to his local repository, and then he can push that revision into, say, Lisa's repository or he can retrieve revisions, he can pull revisions from Lisa's repository. Now, even in a distributed system, if you have many people working together, you'll generally want some central repository through which everyone can sync. Otherwise, revisions would have to be sent individually out to everyone else, which is inefficient and cumbersome. Notice in the diagram here that the central repository generally doesn't have a working directory of its own because, well, no one would use it, it would just be a waste of space. Now, as for the actual version control systems in use, here's a brief history. Concurrent versions system, aka CVS, was created back in about 1990, and it was the dominant open source version control system for about 12 or 13 years, until it was supplanted by Subversion, uh, also known as SVN, which was released back in 2000 and quite quickly took over the market from CVS. Meanwhile, up until 2002, the Linux kernel project itself didn't use version control at all, really. They had a whole uh, mess of patches which they would maintain. And that situation got progressively messier and messier until, in 2002, 
uh, the Linux kernel adopted a distributed version control system called BitKeeper. The problem there was that BitKeeper was a proprietary system, and though the Linux kernel was granted a free license to use BitKeeper, this license was revoked a few years later, and so Linux needed a new version control system. So Linus Torvalds himself actually sat down and created a new system which he called Git, which was first released in 2005 and has been used for the Linux kernel and many other projects since. In that same year, 2005, another distributed version control system was released called Mercurial, which is abbreviated as HG because HG is the atomic symbol of Mercury. Now, here in 2012, CVS is pretty much dead, having been totally eclipsed by Subversion, and then Subversion, I would say, is actually now on the decline because it's being eclipsed by uh, distributed version control, namely Git and Mercurial. While conceptually, distributed systems are really a bit trickier to understand than centralized systems, uh, in practice, it's probably best to actually start today learning a, a distributed system. And if we have to choose between Git and Mercurial, well, the two at their core are conceptually very, very similar, but Mercurial in total does have an edge in terms of simplicity. So Mercurial is the system we'll be learning how to use. Before we get into Mercurial, however, there's some conceptual ground we have to cover concerning what are called diffs and patches. Diff, short for difference, is a standard Unix utility which analyzes two files and produces from them what's called a diff or a patch file, which represents the minimal set of changes it takes to get from one file to another. So you have two similar files, X and Y, which are close, but not exactly the same. They have some lines in common, but then other lines that differ. If you take the diff of X and Y, what you get is a file that represents all the changes you have to make to X to produce Y. To understand this, let's look at how the algorithm which produces these diffs, produces these patches, how it actually works. The most commonly used diff algorithm works by finding the so-called LCS, the longest common subsequence. In case you're not clear on the math terminology, a sequence is a series of elements of data in a particular order. And a subsequence is just a selection of elements from that original sequence, but uh, maintaining the same order from that original sequence. For simplicity, we'll demonstrate with sequences that are made up just of letters. So here we have some original sequence that reads A, B, A, G, H, B, G, G. Uh, notice that it has repeating elements. It's possible to have uh, multiple A's, multiple G's, multiple B's, etc. And while we could swap the position of any two equivalent elements, you could swap the A here for the other A. It doesn't matter because they're both the same value. Otherwise, though, you can't move things around and still have the same sequence. It would be a different sequence if we did. And then we have two example subsequences of this original sequence. We have A, B, G, 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 and we have B, A, H, B. A subsequence is basically formed by taking the original sequence and deciding which elements we want to keep and which we don't, and we just remove all the stuff we want to drop, and what we're left with, in order, is our subsequence. And understand that the full original sequence is considered a subsequence of itself, and also the null sequence, the sequence of no elements, that's also considered technically a subsequence of any other sequence, really. So it actually works out that the number of subsequences for any sequence is 2 to the nth, where n is the number of elements in the original sequence because for every additional element in the original sequence, you're doubling the number of possibilities. So here the original sequence has eight elements, so 2 to the 8, that's 256. There are 256 different subsequences for this one sequence. So now you should understand what a sequence and a subsequence is. As for the LCS, the longest common subsequence, here we have two sequences, sequence 1 and sequence 2, and between them, we have a number of common subsequences, subsequences which are found in both. For example, GH is a subsequence found in both sequence 1 and sequence 2. The longest common subsequence, then, is just the common subsequence which has the most number of elements. In this case, though, we have a tie. We have the subsequence BGH and the subsequence EGH, both of which have three elements. For the purposes of the diff algorithm, it generally doesn't matter which we use, so we can pick either. So let's just go ahead and take the first one. Let's pick BGH as our longest common subsequence. You may notice, though, that in sequence 2, the subsequence BGH actually occurs twice. We can select the first G in sequence 2, or we can use the second G. It actually doesn't matter. So again, we have a choice. We can go with BGH where the G is the first G, or we can go with BGH where the G is the second G. We'll just go ahead and use the first one. If we then line up the two sequences such that the elements of the longest common subsequence line up, 
this is what we get. Just visually now, you can see the minimal set of changes you'd have to make to get from sequence 1 to sequence 2. First you'd have to drop AE from the front, uh, then you'd have to drop the A and replace it with CD, and then you'd have to add EGJ after, between the G and the H of the common subsequence, and at the end you'd uh, remove BGG. That is the diff, the minimal set of changes. Now expressed more formally to express the diff from sequence 1 to sequence 2, uh, we would need to record where in the original sequence these changes need to be made. So quickly just inventing our own little notation scheme, here 1 minus AE means at position 1 in the original sequence drop A and E. 4 minus A means drop at position 4 the element A. And then 4 plus means at position 4 in the original sequence add in C and D and so forth. So we'd have to denote which elements, whether we're dropping them, whether we're adding them, and at what position are we dropping or adding them. And a subtlety being that when it comes to denoting where to drop an element, we just have the index of where that element actually is in the original sequence, but then when it comes to adding elements, the number denotes the position in the original sequence in front of which these elements are being added. So when we write 6 plus E, G, J, that inserts those three elements at the position immediately in front of the sixth element of the original sequence, so right in front of the H. So again, given this diff, this list of changes to make, given only sequence 1, we could then reconstruct sequence 2. That's the whole point of the diff. And be very clear that diffs are not commutative. The diff of sequence 1 to sequence 2 is not the same as the diff from sequence 2 to sequence 1. While it has the same number of lines, and those lines have the same elements in them, all the pluses and minuses get swapped, and the positions changed, because these numbers now denote positions in sequence 2, not in sequence 1. So here when we write 1 plus AE, that means add, right in front of element 1, put an A and an E. And notice that the last line specifies a position of 9. Well, there isn't any element 9, because there are only 8 elements here, but we're going by the convention that elements are added in front of the specified position. So 9 plus here means to tack on to the end. So this is how you produce diffs. Given two sequences of data, first find the longest common subsequence, and then record all the differences between all the other elements. Of course, what we glossed over was how to actually find the longest common subsequence given two sequences, but that's beyond our scope, and it's really not important, because the essence here is that it's the LCS which identifies the parts that don't change, so we can identify the minimal set of changes. When it comes to producing diffs on real data, we have to decide what are the elements that make up our sequence of data. When it comes to text files, it almost always makes most sense to treat the lines as the elements which make up the sequence of data. So given these two text files, text1 and text2, and then finding the diff that gets us text2 from text1, the longest common subsequence has two lines. First, roses are red, and then, and so are you. So we end up with a diff with one deletion and one insertion. First delete the line, violets are green, and then insert the two lines at the same position, violets are blue, sugar is sweet. Now, a somewhat unintuitive consequence of the way diffs work is that when you edit a file and then diff that file with an earlier version, the lines which you've edited, which you've changed, they get expressed in the diff as both a dropped line and an added line. So here, when we have text 1 where it says sugar is sweat, and then we have text 2 where it says sugar is sweet, the diff from text 1 to text 2 reads first drop the line, sugar is sweat, and then add in the line, sugar is sweet. Even though just a single character was changed, it was expressed very verbosely in the diff as dropping a whole line and adding in a whole line, which probably strikes you as pretty wasteful, but that's how it's done. Now, the format for diffs, which I've shown so far, is just a syntax which I made up. Uh, the actual format used by the diff utility looks like this. The line 2c2,3 denotes that the following changes apply to line 2 in the original file, and the range of lines from 2 to 3 in the modified file, and the c here stands for change, meaning we're both removing lines and adding lines. And then the removed lines afterwards are expressed uh, starting with a left angle bracket, and then after a divisor line with three hyphens, the added lines are expressed starting with a right angle bracket. Strictly speaking, there's some superfluous information here. 
the C denoting that this is a change rather than just an addition or deletion of lines. That's not necessary because the fact that lines are being added and removed is expressed by the angle brackets. The divisor line with the three hyphens isn't strictly necessary, it's just there for visual clarity really. Uh, and then also the range of lines in the modified file 2 comma 3, that's not necessary either, it just makes the diff more readable. For another example, here the diff between text 1 and text 2 denotes two separate changes. First an addition of the lines Lance and John, and a deletion of the line Alice. Where it says 0a 1 comma 2, a denotes that this is an addition, 1 comma 2 denotes the position of the lines in the modified file in text 2, and 0 denotes the position at which to insert these lines. In this format, the added lines get inserted after the specified line. So to insert something at the front, you specify line 0, even though of course there isn't a line 0. And the deleted line Alice here is preceded with 2d3. d meaning delete, 2 specifying the line in the original file which we're deleting, and 3 here specifies the position of the line before the deleted line, the line before Alice, its position in the modified file. So the line before Alice here is Ted, and in the modified file, Ted is at line 3. This format for diffs is actually just the default used by the diff utility. There are a couple others which are actually more commonly used, one of which is called the context format, so called because when it specifies lines to add and remove, it provides extra context lines uh, around those additions and deletions. This extra context helps in two ways. First, it can help in cases where you're applying a patch to a file which is not exactly the same as the original file from which the diff was produced. So if you produce a diff, but then make a handful of edits on the original file, um, with this context format especially, you can often get away with still applying the patch, even on top of those changes. Because the extra context provided helps the patch utility make smart decisions when the original file is not in the precise state it was uh, when the patch was produced. The other purpose of this extra context is it helps the patch utility detect when the patch is being applied erroneously to the wrong file. So if you produce a diff from A to B and then try and apply the patch onto some un unrelated file C, the context format allows the patch utility to detect such erroneous cases. So looking at this example context to diff, it starts out with a line with three asterisks and then the name of the original file and its timestamp and then the second line has three hyphens followed by the name of the modified file and its timestamp. And then the actual content of the diff is divided into sections called hunks, uh, denoted by uh, a series of asterisks. In the hunk here, the three asterisks, one comma four, that denotes a section that's removing lines, and then the line with three hyphens, one comma five, denotes the start of a section that adds lines. The lines which actually get removed begin with a hyphen, or a minus sign if you prefer, uh, and the lines which actually get added begin with a plus sign. And then all the other lines there, uh, where it says Ted, Yuri, Nadine, that's just context. 1 comma 4 between the asterisks is denoting the range of lines in the original file, which this section denotes, and then the 1 comma 5 denotes the range of lines in the modified file, which the following section denotes. So that's the context format. You'll note it has a good bit of redundancy. There's some uh, context lines which needlessly are being uh, expressed twice in different sections. So to fix that redundancy, there's actually a third diff format called the unified format. In the unified format, adjacent sections of additions and deletions get collapsed into one section. So here again at the top, we're denoting the name of the original file and its timestamp and the modified file and its timestamp, though this time, quite confusingly, the three hyphens denote the original file and three plus signs denote the modified file. And then each section, each hunk, begins with a line surrounded in double at signs, and inside the two pairs of numbers, 1 comma 4 and 1 comma 5, even though they superficially resemble the ranges we saw in the other formats, uh, what it actually means is the first number is the starting line and the second number is the number of lines at that position. So minus 1 comma 4 means four lines starting at line 1 in the original file, and plus 1 comma 5 means five lines starting at line 1 in the modified file. So this unified format provides the advantage of the context format, it has that extra context, yet it's considerably less verbose. So it's this unified format which tends to be used most commonly these days. 
Now, when it comes to producing diffs for binary files, things are a bit more problematic. First off, it's not so clear how to logically group a binary file into a sequence of elements. When we find the longest common subsequence, do we consider each byte to be an element of the sequence? Or do we consider some arbitrary sized chunks to be the elements of the sequence? Any choice we make would work, it would produce a diff, but the question is which would be most efficient? Which would produce the smallest diffs and require the least amount of processing? Where things get especially ugly is with compressed files, meaning both zip archives and tar archives, but also most compressed media formats like MP3s or H.264 video. The problem with compression is that by its nature, when you make one small change to your data and then have it compressed again, it's like say you edit your audio file, you cut out a little snippet or you add a little snippet or, or something like that, and then you compress it again, well, the resulting file bit for bit tends to change quite radically from the original. Basically, small changes ripple out to the rest of the file. That's just the nature of compression. So if we're working, say, on a piece of audio data, and as we work on it, we keep changing it, and we want to keep a record of those changes, keeping the record of those changes with diffs wouldn't actually really save anything. You'd be best off just preserving each individual version in the whole. So it works out that binary diffs are less generally useful than textual diffs. Recording the version history of binary files with diffs generally just wastes processing power without really saving much space, if any. The two cases where binary diffs do end up being useful is in first the case of diffing between executable files and in the case of remotely syncing a bunch of files. One popular binary diff tool is called BSDiff, BS standing for binary software because BSDiff is optimized for the case of diffing files of machine code like executable files. The BSDiff algorithm doesn't work precisely like the LCS algorithm we saw in diff, but it starts from the same basic principle of trying to identify areas of commonality between the two files, and so just does that in a more sophisticated way. And then having found the areas of commonality and the areas of near commonality, uh, it then from that produces a, a patch file. For remote syncing of files, a popular tool in Unix is called rsync, standing for remote sync. And the idea of rsync is that you want to have two directories or two files on, on remote systems and you want them to match up. If you make changes in one copy and then want to send them to the other copy, rather than sending the files in whole, rsync will use a technique called a rolling hash to find those portions of just those files which have changed, and it will send only those changes, potentially saving you a whole lot of time and bandwidth. Of course, rsync doesn't solve the problem that if you change, say, a compressed file like an mp3 file, just a little bit, well, those small changes could end up radically changing uh, the content of the file bit for bit. So rsync may end up sending about as much data as the entirety of the file. In any case, just understand that versioning binary files is somewhat problematic, so it's something we'll come back to at the end. Happily though, most software projects consist mostly of just source code files. Most version control systems are designed with primarily text files in mind. When we take two versions of the same file and resolve them into one, we call that a merge. Ultimately, there's no definitive way to programmatically perform a merge, because when it comes time to reconcile the differences between the two versions we're merging, that requires human judgment, because, say, I'm merging two source files together. Is the resulting code correct? Well, only the programmer can judge that. In practice, though, we do have merging tools which, in most cases, will merge together two source files the way that a programmer would have done it. Just understand that, inherently, it's a flawed process. In any case, how do these merge tools work? Well, there's different merge algorithms, the simplest of which is what's just called a two-way merge. It's called a two-way merge because it's working with the two versions of the file which we are merging together. So, say we have these two versions, one reading Ted, Alice, Yuri, Nadine, and the second reading John, Lance, Ted, Yuri, Nadine. Like in the diff, the merge first finds the longest common subset, but rather than output a diff, it outputs a new version, the merge of the two original versions. And in this merger, the algorithm blindly assumes that you just want to take as much as you can from both original versions. So that's why the merger here has both Alice from one version and John and Lance from the other. And be very clear that a merge, unlike a diff, is a commutative operation. So the merger of file A and file B is the same as the merger of file B and file A, which was not the case with diffs. What can easily happen in a merge is that you have portions of the two original versions which conflict, 
That is, they have lines which are found in both, except there's differences. Here, for example, in one version, between Ted and Yuri, we have the line Alice, but then in the other, between Ted and Yuri, we have the line Bruce. So the question is, well, what should end up in the merge? And the answer is that the merge algorithm doesn't know. It can't resolve this itself, so it actually has to prompt the user of the merge tool. It has to say, hey, there's this conflict here, so you're going to have to resolve this yourself, meaning you're going to have to decide what should go there. I'm just a dumb computer program. I don't know what the code or data in these two files mean, so I can't make this decision. So what the merge tool will typically do in these cases is warn you that, hey, there were conflicts that you have to resolve, and in the output file, it will put a little marker saying there's a conflict here that you have to resolve. So you go through the file and find those markers and replace them with what should actually go there. A merging algorithm that does a much better job avoiding conflicts is the three-way merge algorithm, which is so-called because it involves not just the two versions you're merging together, but also the common ancestor of those two versions. By looking at the common ancestor as well as the two versions we're actually merging, the algorithm can automatically resolve those conflicts in which, in one version, there's been a change since the common ancestor, but in the other, there hasn't. And the presumption there is that you want the one that has changed, because we want all the changes since the common ancestor, basically. So, say for example, you and I are editing the same file of source code. Well, we both started from a common ancestor. That was our starting point, where we both were. And then in my version, I made my changes, and in your version, you made yours. And then when we merged them together, if there are lines where I've made changes since the common ancestor, but you haven't, presumably we want my changes in the merger. And this, of course, works the other way. If you've made changes in certain lines, but I haven't touched those lines, then we want your changes in the merger. If, however, there are lines where I've made changes and you've made changes, then there's a conflict, and then the person doing the merge has to manually make that decision. They have to decide what should really go in that spot. Maybe they take the lines from my version, maybe they take the lines from your version, Maybe they end up putting something else there entirely. But again, the general advantage of three-way merges over two-way merges is that the three-way merge can automatically resolve many conflicts. Keep in mind, though, that it's really painful if you ever have to merge two significantly different versions of a large code base, because you'll likely end up with a good number of conflicts, and you won't necessarily be in a position to know how to resolve all those conflicts. So the general prescription about merging is merge early, merge often. Don't let different versions of your code base uh, diverge too long, otherwise it's going to be a huge pain in the ass when you want to merge them back together. The last thing to say about mergers is you must be very, very clear that even in cases where the merger of two versions of your code uh, produced no conflicts or whatever conflicts there were got resolved automatically, even in such cases of a conflictless merge, it's quite possible that the result of the merger could be flawed. It could be introducing new bugs because changes I've made to the code and changes you've made to the code may not conflict at the level of text, but in terms of logic, what the code actually does, that could be introducing a new bug because I didn't know what changes you were making and you didn't know what changes I was making and when we reconcile the two, um, there could be a flaw. So once you've done a merger and there either were no conflicts to begin with or whatever conflicts there were you resolved, well, that's generally when your real work begins, because then you have to test your code and make sure you're not introducing new giant bugs. No program, of course, can do that for you any more than you could have a program which actually writes your code for you. In the terminology of Mercurial, the revisions, the snapshots within a repository, are usually known as change sets. So each time you check in your code from the working directory, you're creating a new change set. Each change set is uniquely identified by a change set ID, which is generated as a SHA-1 hash of the content of that revision of that change set. And a SHA-1 hash is 160 bits in length, and so represented as hex is 40 digits long. But because a 40 digit long hex number is pretty ugly, Mercurial will usually display these IDs abbreviated to their first 12 digits. Now, the purpose of these change set IDs is that you have a unique identifier for each change set which is unique across all repositories. So when this change set gets sent around to different repositories, it can reliably be uniquely identified. As a convenience though, every change set in a repo is also known by a local revision number. These are numbers assigned to the change sets in the order in which they are added to the repository, starting from zero. Just be clear though that these numbers only uniquely identify a change set within that repository. So the change set with local revision number 8 in my repository is not going to necessarily be the same change set 
with local revision number 8 in any other repository. By convention in Mercurial, the local revision number and the change set ID of a single change set are displayed in this form, with the local revision number first, followed by a colon, then the short form, the 12-digit form of the change set ID. Every change set in Mercurial has a parent, the only exception being the special null change set, which is an empty change set and the parent of the first commit. So here in this diagram, we're representing a repository where we've made three commits, the first with the local revision number 0 and a parent of null, the second with a local revision number of 1 and the parent of local revision 0, and the third having the local revision number 2 and local revision 1 is its parent. So we have three successive snapshots of our working directory. So the user of this repository first created their project, they initialized the repository to create it, um, they did a bit of work, they added some files into their project, and then they made their first commit. Then they did some more work, probably adding more files, editing their existing files, and made a second commit. And then did more work, made more changes, and made their third commit. A very important concept in Mercurial is that the working directory is sort of like a pseudo change set itself. It's a change set in waiting that we have yet to commit to the repository. And very importantly, the working directory has a current parent meaning if we were to then commit the working directory, the new change set would have the same parent, and the working directory's parent would be updated to be the new change set. So the working directory's parent is automatically updated every time you make a new commit, but you can also manually change the parent of the working directory, which is something you will do when you want to create a new branch based on an older revision. So here, for example, we've updated the working directory's parent back to the first change set, and so now if we were to commit, this would create a change set whose parent is that first commit, is local revision 0. What we've done effectively is create a new head and a new tip. In the terminology of Mercurial, a head is a change set with no children, and the tip is the newest head in that repo. It's the head with the highest local revision number. Before this last commit, the repo only had one head, revision 2, and that also was the tip because it was the only head. When it comes time to merge two branches, we update the working directory to have two parents, not just one. In the working directory, we then go about the business of merging these two versions together into one, and then we can commit our merge as a new chain set, which will have these two parents. And as usual, the working directory itself is updated such that the new chain set is its single parent. One of the most important concepts in Mercurial is that chain sets are immutable, meaning once a chain set is created, it can't be modified and even more restrictive, you can't even delete change sets. Once a change set is in a repository, you don't get rid of it. The general reason for this is that the versions of the files in a change set are not necessarily stored in whole. Most of the time, most files are stored as diffs based upon the previous version, the versions in the parent of that change set. And in fact, in that parent, uh, there may not be full copies of the file either. There, there, there are likely just diffs. So when a particular version of a file is retrieved from the repository, it is reconstructed from a bunch of diffs applied to the original version in the original commit. Though actually, in, in some cases, Mercurial will decide that in some later chain set, rather than storing a diff, it makes more sense to store that version of the file in whole for that chain set. So what's stored in a chain set is first a manifest of all the files, a, a list of all the files in that particular revision, uh, and then you'll have, uh, for some files in the, in the manifest, you'll have just a, a diff uh, based upon some earlier version, or you'll have a snapshot, which is to say a whole copy of that particular version of that file. And then also in the change set, of course, is stored the parent ID, or IDs if there's two, which is the case when you're merging together two other change sets. And then there are a few other pieces of meta information, like a timestamp of when the change set was created, usually the name and email address of the committer, the person who made the chain set, and then also a commit message, just a, a short textual description about that revision supplied by the person who committed it. The first two Mercurial commands we'll look at are init and clone. Init, short for initialization, is used to create a totally new repo, whereas clone is used to create a repo which is a copy of some other existing repo, that is a repo in which all the same chain sets are present. As you'll see, when we clone a repo, the repo from which we are cloning is very often remote. It's somewhere out there on the network. First, though, we'll demonstrate cloning a local repo, a repo which resides in the local file system. 
So looking at the command line on my Unix system, I have my user prompt here reading Brian at Ubuntu, that's my username, and then after the colon is the shell's current working directory, and tilde is just shorthand for my home directory, so slash home slash Brian. And for the first command here, I write hg space init space foo. hg is the name of the mercurial binary, the executable file located in, in my bin directory. hg, remember, is the atomic symbol for mercury, and the command's called hg, not mercurial, because hg is much more convenient to write. And the general pattern with the hg command is that the first argument is the name of the subcommand we're invoking. Mercurial has a few dozen subcommands, init and clone are just the first two we'll look at. So here when we write hg init foo, foo is the argument to the init command. Uh, in this case, init is expecting you to specify a directory in which to initialize a new repository. So assuming I didn't already have a directory named foo, hg init will create it, and then in that directory it will create a subdirectory called .hg. And we demonstrate this by listing the content of the foo directory with ls hyphen a foo. Recall that by convention in Unix, Files and directories beginning with a period are considered hidden directories and files, meaning that the LS program doesn't normally uh, list them. So we use the hyphen A option here, which tells LS to list all the contents, uh, even the hidden files and directories. Now, this .hg directory, that is the actual repository. That's where the chain sets and all the other information the repository needs gets stored. The directory foo itself is our working directory for that repository. So later inside foo, we'll be adding files and committing them. So now, having created this repository, in our last command we clone it. We clone it to a directory bar, also in my home directory. And as you can see, once the clone operation finishes, Mercurial prints out two lines on the status of the new repository. So there's a bit of an asymmetry there. When you use clone, it, it prints out some status, but when you use init, it just does so silently without reporting anything. I guess because when you initialize a totally new repository, it's just this, always just this empty .hg directory, so there's never anything to report. To send chain sets from one repository to another, we have two commands, push and pull. In a push, you're sending chain sets from your repository to some other, whereas in a pull, you're bringing in chain sets from some other repository into your own. Pushes and pulls are probably most commonly done between repositories on separate systems, over the network, but it is also possible to push and pull between repositories on the same system. So, for example, with our two repositories, foo and bar, if I want to push from foo to bar, I first change directory into the working directory of the foo repository, because when you perform a push or pull, the repository from which you are pushing or into which you are pulling, that's not specified as an option on the command line, it's taken from the current working directory of the mercurial process, which is inherited from the shell process. So that's why we change the current working directory of our shell first. So once we're in the directory of the foo repository and we invoke hg push, the only argument we provide specifies the path of the repository to which we are pushing. And pull works the same way. We specify the path to the repository from which we are pulling. Now the push and pull commands are smart in the sense that they will only copy the chain sets that need to be copied. That is those chain sets which the, which the destination repository does not already have. And because we just uh, cloned bar from foo before we invoked this push and pull, well, there are no change sets that one has that the other doesn't have. In fact, actually, both of these repositories currently don't have any change sets at all. But the reason it says no change is found is because foo and bar currently have exactly the same set of change sets, which just happens to be no change sets at all. Now, it's important to understand that the idea with pushes and pulls is that we only exchange chain sets between repositories which are related, meaning that one is a clone of the other, either directly or indirectly. If you have repository A, which is cloned from B, which is cloned from C, then A and C are also related, just indirectly. Now, if you do have two unrelated repositories, you can push and pull between them. The problem is just that it just doesn't really make sense. It's not something you generally want to do. In fact, it's something you want to avoid doing on accident because it means polluting a repo with all sorts of change sets not related to your project. And in fact, the way most people work with Mercurial, it's common for a repo to push and pull exclusively with the repo from which it was cloned. So with this in mind, when you clone a repository, Mercurial creates a configuration file in the .hg directory called hgrc, which stands for Mercurial Run Commands. 
Uh, so for example, in our bar repository, which was cloned from the foo repository, you'll see these two lines, uh, paths, and underneath default equals slash home slash Brian slash foo, which is the uh, path to the repository from which this repository was cloned. And the significance of the default path is that if we invoke the push and pull commands without specifying any repo, they will be assumed by default. So I can invoke hg push and it pushes by default to slash home slash Brian slash foo. And likewise, hg pull uh, without any argument is pulling by default from slash home slash Brian slash foo. So you'll find most of the time when you invoke push and pull, uh, you just write hg push or hg pull. You don't specify any other repo. So now we have the commands init and clone for creating repos and then push and pull for exchanging change sets between them. Uh, but what about actually creating change sets? Well, the primary command for that is commit, as in commit the working directory, create a change set from the current state of the working directory and add that change set to the repo. A critical thing to understand about how commits work though is that the working directory itself, just like a change set, has its own manifest. That is a list of all the files which are included uh, in this change set in waiting, this change set yet to be. So creating new files in our working directory and invoking hg commit is not sufficient to then get those files uh, in a new change set. We actually have to explicitly add them to the manifest of the working directory and only then will they be included in the next commit. Now you don't have to do this for every file included in the commit every single time you make a new commit because the working directory inherits the manifest from its parent change set. So you only need to add the files which are new, the files which are present now in the working directory that weren't present in the parent change set. And lastly, in the course of demonstrating these two commands, we'll use the log command, which lists the change sets of the repo uh, in order of newest first. So the log command doesn't actually do anything, it doesn't modify anything, it's just an informative command. It just reports the current set of change sets in your repo. So again, at the command line, uh, notice we're in the slash bar directory. So we're in the working directory of the bar repo. And we're going to start off by creating a file in that directory called file A uh, with the text content that just reads blah, blah. And we do so with the command echo, which recall is a built-in shell command, which just uh, echoes its arguments to standard output. So blah, blah is being echoed to standard output. And then the greater than sign, if you don't recall, is a, a shell operator which uh, performs redirection. It's redirecting the standard output of the echo command uh, to the file, which is called file A, which is newly created here if it doesn't already exist. And so in the next command, if we invoke ls, it's listing the content of the bar directory, which now has file A. Uh, notice that .hg is not included in the listing here because we didn't specify the hyphen A option. It's still there, it's just not being reported in the output of ls here. And now having created this new file in the working directory, if we try invoking hg commit, we get this error message saying nothing changed. Mercurial won't let us commit unless something has actually changed in our working directory relative to the working directory's parent, which is currently the null change set. The problem here, as I explained, is that the manifest for the working directory is currently empty. There are no files in it. So even though we have an actual file in our working directory, as far as Mercurial can see, it's not supposed to be included in the next commit. We can fix this though by invoking hg add. And notice uh, here I didn't actually specify which file to add, I just wrote hg add, and by default it, hg add will add all files, all files which aren't currently already in the manifest. So it tells us adding file A, it's now there in the manifest, and if we invoke hg commit, uh, this time it will work. Though notice when we invoke hg commit, we have to specify the option hyphen m followed by a string reading our first commit. Uh, that hyphen m argument is the message argument. Uh, when you create a commit, Mercurial very stringently requires you, the committer, to actually provide a commit message so that when someone reads through the log, they can see what these revisions are supposed to be. And obviously, our first commit is not a very helpful message, but in, in practice, you'd have something more meaningful, like uh, here's where we fixed this bug, or here's where we added a new feature, something like that. I highly recommend you get in the practice of really coming up with meaningful commit messages. In any case, so here hg commit succeeds, um, and that creates a new change set consisting of just the file, file A, and, and so if we invoke hg log immediately after, we can see it's reporting, hey, there's this one change set, it has a local revision number zero, 
and its change set ID is starts with the 12 digits 7C0BB89B0F71. Um, the tag business we'll talk about uh, much later. Ignore that for now. Um, user is Brian because that's the name I entered in a config file on my system. So that's the default uh, username Every, anytime I make a commit in Mercurial. Uh, on your system, you should enter your name in, in the config file. And then after that, of course, the date when this change set was created and the time. And then the summary, that's the commit message. So in this example, hglog is just printing out one change set because that's all we have. We just have the one change set. If we had 300 change sets, hglog would uh, print out all 300 change sets, starting with the last one all the way back to the first one. So just to be absolutely clear about what a repository now looks like, we have this single change set, 7Z0BB89B0F71. The working directory now has that change set as its parent, uh, which itself has the null change set as its parent. Now, when it comes time to remove a file from your working directory, if that file was present in the parent change set, you shouldn't just simply delete the file, because then uh, Mercurial will be confused. It will expect to find this file in your working directory that isn't there anymore. Mercurial will consider the file missing. So instead of using just the rm command like you normally do in Unix to delete files, you should use Mercurial's remove command, which will not only delete the file, it will remove it from the working directory's manifest, such that it won't be included in the next commit. When we demonstrate this, we'll use the status command, which shows the status of the working directory. That is, it shows which files have changed relative to the parent of the working directory, which files are set to be added, which are set to be removed and also which files are missing, that is, which files you've deleted without actually removing them from the manifest. So, resuming our previous example, if we start out by using hdremove to remove file A, that will remove file A from the manifest of the working directory, and also uh, actually delete the file from the working directory. And then in the next command, we create a new file, file B. And then next, in the invocation of ls, the content of the working directory is currently just file B. There's no file A because we just removed it. And now when we invoke HG status, it reports that file A uh, denoted with the R is marked for removal and file B is denoted with the question mark because there is no file B in the manifest of the parent chain set nor in the manifest of the current working directory. So Mercurial is not currently tracking this file, as we say. And now when we make a new commit, the, the new chain set doesn't include file A, nor does it include file B. In fact, it's empty. There's no files in its manifest. So, in fact, if we now recreate file A and then invoke HG status, what it reports is that both file A and file B have a question mark because neither is present in the manifest of the working directory nor in the manifest of the parent of the working directory. Be clear about the HG status command that it doesn't list all files in the manifest of the working directory by default, it only lists those about which there's something interesting to say, like, is this file going to be added? Has it been modified since the parent? Uh, is it set to be removed? Is it uh, a, now a missing file, denoted with an exclamation mark? That is, is it a file that, according to the working directory manifest, is supposed to be there, but for some reason is not? And question mark, again, basically means not tracked. It's a file which is there in the working directory, but is not being tracked. It's not listed in the manifest of the working directory nor in the parent chain set of the working directory. To copy versions of files stored in the repository into your working directory, we have two commands, revert and update, which serve quite different purposes. The revert command is so called because the idea is that you revert some file in your working directory back to its state from an earlier chain set, and it does this by reconstructing the file from the diffs and snapshots actually stored in the repo. And once the version of the file is reconstructed, it's then copied into your working directory. Most commonly, the revert command is used to revert a file back to its state in the parent of the working directory. So in your working directory, you're working on the next version, which you're going to commit, but you make some mistake, you tie yourself up in knots, and you decide, well, I'm just going to scrap these changes and revert this file back to its previous state. So that's how revert is most commonly used. And if you don't specify any particular revision for a file, it will just by default use the revision in the parent. Um, but occasionally it is useful. You can specify some earlier revision, some other revision, and revert the file to that revision instead of necessarily the parent of the working directory. The purpose of the update command is quite different. With update, we're generally bringing the entire working directory in line with some previous revision. 
for putting everything in the working directory into the state it was in for a specified change set. And very importantly, the change set to which we are updating, that becomes the parent of the working directory. In fact, this is the primary command by which we modify the parent of the working directory. So anytime we want to go back to an old revision and make a branch off of that revision, we first do an update, then we make our modifications in the working directory and commit. And that change set will be a new head, effectively a new branch in the repo. So for example, if this is the state of our repository and we want to create a new branch off of the first commit, well, first we update back to that change set. That puts all the files in the working directory back to the state they were in in that first change set and it also modifies the parent of the working directory now to now be that change set. If we then do our work in the working directory and make another commit, we've effectively created a new head, a new branch. So going back to our example on the command line, remember that we've made a second commit, but the manifest of that commit happened to be empty. There were no files in it, and yet our directory contains these two files, file A and file B, so HG status reports them with question marks, meaning that these files aren't being tracked. And if we then attempt to update back to the first commit, which is local revision zero, here the hyphen R argument stands for revision. Well, the update doesn't complete. We get this error saying that there's an untracked file in the working directory, which differs from the file in the requested revision. And that's file A, because if you recall, in our first commit, we had a file A. And so Mercurial is being cautious because if it's going to update back to that first revision, it's going to need to clobber that file. And because Mercurial knows that this file A, the one we've newly created, uh, isn't in the repository, uh, it may represent work that we don't want to lose. So Mercurial's being cautious here. But assuming that we know, hey, we don't care about that file, it's okay if we clobber it, then we invoke update with the hyphen capital C option, which stands for clean, but what it really means is to, if necessary, clobber any files necessary, even if those files might have work that has not been committed. So the invocation of update here reports that one file has been updated, that is the file A has been clobbered with the version that existed uh, back in the first change set. And if we invoke HD status, then it tells us, oh, there's just one file now, which is present in the working directory, but is not in the manifest of the working directory or in the manifest of the parent. And the parent again here is the original change set, the first change set, local revision zero. But as the ls command makes clear, file A and file B are both in the working directory. HG status doesn't report on file A because file A is currently in the precise same state it was found in the parent, in the change set we just updated to. So as far as HG status is concerned, uh, there's nothing to report about it. Now, if we then modify file A, and we do so here using the echo command, uh, but with the append redirection operator, which is the two angle brackets that appends blah blah to the end of file A. So we've modified file A, and then we invoke HG status, and HG status tells us, yes, file A is marked with an M because it's been modified since the parent. If we decide we want to discard those changes in file A, we invoke HG revert file A, and that checks out again. It checks out the version of file A found in the parent. Um, and then when we invoke HG status, it's not reported anymore because now it's back in the state where it's unchanged since the parent. Notice that when we invoked revert here, we didn't specify which change set we want to revert file A back to. So by default, it assumes that we mean the parent of the working directory, which again is local revision zero. If we wanted some other version of file A, we could have specified a different revision with the hyphen R option. When it comes time to merge in Mercurial, we use the merge command, which doesn't work by, as you might expect, merging two chain sets together, but rather merging the working directory with some other chain set. In this merging process, Mercurial does three things. First, it reconciles the manifest of the working directory with that of the chain set. It, that is, it decides what files should exist in the merger of the two and what they should be called and so forth. And it effectively merges the manifests together. And then the second thing Mercurial does is once it's decided what files should end up in the merger, it then has to reconcile, it has to merge the individual files together. So the file named foo in the working directory has to get merged with the file named foo from the chain set. And then the third and final thing that Mercurial does in the merge is that it updates the working directory to have the change set as its second parent. So the working directory ends up with two parents, the one it had before the merge, but then also the change set we just merged with. 
be very clear that unlike in some other revision control systems, in Mercurial, the merge does not actually make a new change set. It doesn't do a commit. It does the merger in the working directory, and then the expectation is that once you've resolved all the conflicts and uh, done whatever fixes you need, then you can make your commit. You can commit your merge. And once that commit is done, the working directory again just has a single parent, the change set we just made. Now, when demonstrating a merge on the command line, we'll also use the parents command, which simply just lists the current parent or parents of the working directory. First, though, let's consider again this quick example. We have here a repo with two heads, and generally what you want to do with separate heads is merge them together. So we're going to merge the working directory with local revision 3. This merges together the state of the working directory as manifest and its files. It merges that state with the state of change set 3 with its manifest and its version of the files. And the product of that merger is placed in the working directory, so now the working directory manifest and its files reflect that merger. And then, very importantly, the working directory has revision 3 as its other parent. If we perform a commit, this creates a new chain set which has the, the parents, uh, revision 2 and revision 3, uh, and the working directory now just has the single parent, which is the new chain set. So, looking at an example merger on the command line, this time we're going to start with a new repository, one which we've cloned from some existing open source project. So first I'm changing directory back to my home directory, which is denoted with a tilde. Tilde, again, is just a special shell syntax, which is shorthand for my home directory, which is actually slash home slash Brian. Anyway, once I'm back in my home directory, I then invoke hgclone, but this time I'm cloning a remote repository, which I specify with a URL. For this to work, obviously there has to be some server which is uh, publicly serving this repository for people to clone, which is something we'll discuss how to do later. But in any case, we're just cloning a repository. This time it just happens to be on a remote machine on the network out there on the internet. And as Mercurial tells us, it's placing this new repository in the directory grab inside my home directory. So slash home slash Brian slash grab. Grab, by the way, is a Python library that uh, has something to do with scraping websites. I've, I've not used it myself. It's just a project I happen to find on Bitbucket which is a really useful Mercurial hosting site. If you want to have an internet accessible Mercurial repository, I recommend Bitbucket. It, it seems to be the service which everyone uses for Mercurial. There's also for Git, there's a similar site called GitHub, which is also very popular. In any case, so I now have this new clone in my directory grab, so I change directory into grab, and then I invoke HD parents, which lists the current parents of the working directory. Uh, in this case, there's just one, as normally there is. Only after merger are there two parents. Usually there's just one. As you can see, the current parent is local revision number 357. If we're going to demonstrate a merge, we're going to first need a separate branch. Currently there's just one head in this repo, so we're going to create another head. And we'll do so by branching off of the parent of the current parent. So if we want to find out what the parent of 357 is, we just invoke HD parents r 357 and it lists the parents of 357, which, as is usually the case, has the local revision number, which is just one lower, so 356. But be clear that it wasn't necessarily 356, uh, because 357 might be the result of some merger, or, or for some other reason of how the change sets got copied into this repo, the parent of revision 357 might have a totally different revision number than 356. In this case, though, it was just 356. So we're going to update to revision 356 with hg update hyphen r356. And just to demonstrate that, yes, the update really did modify the parent of the working directory, if we invoke hg parents, it then reports, well, now the parent is 356. That's the, that's the current parent of the working directory. And because we just updated to 356, the content of the working directory should now reflect the content of revision 356. Now I'm going to make a small modification to one of the files in the working directory. There's a file test.py in there, which I know exists because I looked earlier. Uh, and having modified test.py, if we then invoke hg status, it tells us that yes, test.py has been modified. The only reason I'm making the modification is because otherwise Mercurial wouldn't let us commit. It would abort and say, hey, you can't commit. There's no differences from the parent. So we made our modification. We do our commit, and Mercurial tells us that, hey, a new head has been created. In other words, we now have a new branch in the repo. And now, if we invoke HG parents, it reports that, hey, the parent of the working directory is currently 358, which is the next provision number available, right? Uh, but then now it's reporting the parent of our parent. It's reporting that the parent of the current parent is 356. 356 is the parent of 358. And the reason it's including that line in the output of HG parents this time is because previously the parent of the parent was just one number lower. So we didn't need to report it. It, was, it could just be assumed to be one number lower than what is reporting as that, that change set. And you'll see this in hglog as well. When it reports a change set, 
it will include a line specifying the parent in cases where the local revision number is not, as is normally the case, just one lower. So when you don't see that line, you just assume that the parent has a local revision number which is one lower. So again, here's the current state of a repository, or at least the few change sets we care about. There are, of course, 356 other change sets, we're just not showing them here. And notice I said 356, not 355, because there's a change set numbered 0. So now we have our separate heads, and we can perform a merge by merging uh, the working directory with revision 357, or alternatively, we can update the working directory to revision 357 and have it merge with 358. Either way would give us really exactly the same result, but for this one really small detail which we'll talk about later. For the most part, you should consider a merge to be a commutative operation. It doesn't matter if we're merging head 357 with 358 or head 358 with 357. Do be clear, though, that in Mercurial, a merge is technically not between two chain sets, but between a chain set and a working directory. So in fact, if we were to modify the working directory first, and then do our merge, we would end up with the merger of those modifications of 358 and 357, not strictly with 358 as it exists in its pristine state. Uh, normally, though, Mercurial will warn you. It'll, it normally expects the working directory to be clean relative to its parent, that is, not to have any changes, because normally doing otherwise, merging into a dirty working directory, a di directory that is no longer exactly like its parent, that's normally a, a mistake. It's generally not something people do intentionally. But if it's what we really want, we can do that. We can merge into a dirty working directory. When we invoke merge, we just have to specify an option telling Mercurial that, yeah, we're really sure we know what we're doing. But in our example, though, we're just going to merge our pristine working directory with a parent of 358 with change set 357. And we do so with the command hg merge and then specify the revision with hyphen r 357. Mercurial then gives us a report of how the merge went, what it did, and if there were any conflicts that Mercurial couldn't resolve. In this case, no, the, there were no conflicts. So what we would normally do now is commit this merge. Though, uh, actually, a really good practice would be to test this version of the code and make sure that uh, the merger didn't break anything. Because, again, even though there weren't any conflicts, it doesn't mean there can't be some sort of logical conflict uh, between the, the version, two separate versions of the code. Uh, and just to demonstrate that after the merge, the uh, working directory now has two parents. If we invoke HG parents, you'll see it's reporting both revision 358 and 357 are the current parents of the working directory. The interesting question now is how exactly does Mercurial do its merger? How does it reconcile the differences between the manifests and between competing versions of the files? Well, we won't explain the process in its entirety, but we can consider some common cases. First understand that merges in Mercurial are three-way merges, so the common ancestor is taken into account. And here we're merging revision 357 with revision 358, or, or technically the working directory uh, with 358 as its parent. But anyway, the common ancestor of 357 and 358 in this case is 356. So when reconciling the differences between 357 and 358, Mercurial looks to 356, and that factors into the decisions it makes. So in the simplest case, you have a file foo found in all three revisions, the two were merging and their common ancestor, and that file foo is the same revision in both the two change sets were merging and their common ancestor. So the obvious thing to do in this case in the merger is just to keep the file in that state. If, however, in the two chain sets we're merging, uh, file foo has changed since the common ancestor, this is the one case where Mercurial actually has to merge two versions of a file together. And it actually does so not with code in Mercurial itself, but by invoking an external program, the, the whatever is the standard merge tool on your system. On most Linux programs these days, that's usually a program called diff3, or a similar one called kdiff3. Diff3 is the most commonly used command line tool for performing merges, and kdiff3 is basically the graphical application equivalent of the command line tool diff3. Now, in the cases where the merge tool can't successfully merge two files without any conflicts, uh, it will then prompt you, the user, uh, to resolve the conflict. So here, for example, in my system is what it looks like when kdiff3 pops up and tells me that I have a conflict to resolve. What you see here in the top two panels are the two original versions of the file, and then in the bottom panel, the wide panel down there, uh, that's the merged version. And you'll notice that in line there's a question mark and a marker of merge conflict. Uh, that's a conflict that I need to resolve manually. Once I resolve the conflict, the merge continues. Another possibility in a merge is that the file has been changed in one of the two change sets since the common ancestor, but not the other. 
In this case, it's that changed version which takes precedence. So in the merger, you'll have the changed version, not the unchanged version. Because again, the general presumption in mergers is that you want as many of the changes as possible. In another case, it's possible that in one of the change sets, you've actually removed the file, whereas in the other, it has remained untouched. And again, the removal of the file is considered a kind of change. So again, we take the change. So that file is not present in the merger. And in the last case, we'll consider you might have in one of the chain sets the file has been removed, but in the other it's been modified. In this case, it's left up for the user to resolve. They're prompted and asked, should the file be deleted, or should the merger take the version that was modified? Because number names are not terribly friendly, you can elect to give chain sets in Mercurial branch names and tags. The main differences between the two being that first, the branch name is an immutable property of a chain set, once you create the change set, you can't change the branch name. Second, branch names need not be unique, that is, multiple change sets within the same repo can have the same branch name. And third, each change set has one and only one branch name. Tags, in contrast, are mutable properties of change sets. They are stored within the repo separate from the change sets themselves, and that allows them to be modified. And whereas a branch name can be shared by multiple chain sets, the same is not the true of a tag. A tag within a repo is meant to only apply to just one revision. And lastly, tags are optional, so chain sets need not have any tags at all, but unlike with branches, you can give a single chain set multiple tags. So we'll look at an example of branch names first, because they're considerably easier to understand than tags. First off, where does a chain set's branch name come from? Well, the branch name is either inherited from the parent change set, or it is explicitly set for that change set by the hg branch command. That is, before you actually make your commit, you set in the working directory the branch name with the command hg branch. And then when you make your commit, it will have that branch name. The null change set has the branch name default. So when you make the first commit in the repo, assuming you haven't explicitly set the branch name to something else, the first commit will inherit the branch name default, from the null change set. And in fact, if you don't ever bother changing the branch name to something other than default, then effectively all subsequent change sets will inherit default as their branch name. So in that sense, default is the default branch name. And in fact, when listing a change set, Mercurial will not report the branch name unless it's something other than default. So if a branch name isn't listed for some change set, you know that its branch name is default. So here in this example, we have five change sets three of which have the branch name default, and two of which have the branch name feature x, which presumably denotes a branch in which the coder was working on feature x. Of course, in a real example, you'd have an actual name for the feature. But in any case, just looking at the history here, we can infer how these branch names were set. The earliest change set here was 124, which has the branch name default, presumably inherited ultimately from the null change set. So this is probably the mainline branch of development. And then someone decided that they're going to work on a new feature in a new branch, so they used the hg branch command to set the branch name of the working directory to feature x, and then they made their commit. That created change set 125, and based off of that head, they continued their work on feature x and made another commit. Meanwhile, either the same coder or some other coder working on the same code, uh, starting from an update to change set 124, they made a new commit, continuing that branch with change set 126. So in both the case of 126 and 127, the committer didn't have to set the branch name with the hg branch command. It was just inherited from the parent. Finally, the last change set here, 128, is a merger of 126 and 127. Effectively, we're merging the work we did on feature x back into the main line of development, back into default. And the way this was done most likely is with the working directory updated to revision 126, a merge was done with revision 127, and then after resolving all the conflicts, revision 128 was committed. Now the question is, why does revision 128 have the branch name default? Well, in a merger, as I mentioned briefly before, there's one small respect in which a merger is not commutative. That is, it matters whether we're merging from 126 to 127, or from 127 to 126. And that is that the branch name is inherited from the first parent, the one which is the parent of the working directory we're merging into, not the other parent, not the other change set which we merged with. So because the working directory was updated to revision 126 and we merged from there with 127, 
the inherited branch name is the one from revision 126, default. Though, of course, we could have just explicitly set the branch name with HG branch to whatever we want, whether default, feature X, or something else entirely. In this case, though, because the idea is to bring the changes of feature X into our main line of development into default, uh, it makes most sense just to do it this way, to from default merge in that other branch. So to demonstrate this on the command line, let's pick up where we left off, where we made our merger, but we didn't actually commit it. So before committing it, though, let's actually explicitly set the branch name. So we do so with hg branch, and then in, in the quote marks, the best branch ever. That's the name of our branch. Be clear, though, that the branch command doesn't actually create the branch, it's just setting the branch name for the next commit. The change set doesn't actually get created until hg commit in the next line. And then after the commit, we use hg parents to confirm that yes, a new change set was just created. Notice it reports the branch name, the best branch ever, and also it shows that this has two parents, not just one, because this change set is the result of a merger. So that's pretty much everything there is to know about branch names. Whether you end up actually using them, that's a matter of preference. Some people like to use them, some people just don't bother. It's really just an organizational tool. And as far as convenience, all it really buys you is that when you specify a revision in a command, usually with the option hyphen R, rather than provide a local revision number or a chain set ID, you can refer to a chain set by its branch name. And the chain set which a branch name refers to is the tip most chain set with that branch name. And some users find that pretty convenient. And the same can be said of tags. Once we give tags to our chain sets, you can then refer to that chain set by the tag name. Though in that case, you never have more than one chain set with the same tag. That's the whole point of tags, is that they uniquely apply to one chain set. So now, how do tags work? Well, tags in your repo are stored in a single file. They're not stored with the chain sets themselves. They're stored in a file in the working directory called .hgtags. So to be clear, in your, your repository foo, .hgtags isn't stored in the .hg subdirectory. It's stored in the directory foo itself with all the other files of your working directory. In fact, you can almost get away with treating this .hg tags like any other file in your working directory. You can create it yourself and edit it yourself, and you can add it to the manifest with the hg add command and so forth. The format of hg tags is simply that every line starts with a chain set ID, the full 40 digit chain set ID, not the 12 digit short form, followed by a space, and then the tag name. So we see in this example here five different tags, uh, the first, uh, the tag demo release, the second uh, tag v0.1, the third with the name v0.2 space alpha, uh, and then the last two also have in the name demo release. Now, I did say that tags in a repo are meant to be unique. You can't have the same tag name applied to multiple chain sets. So what happens when you have a conflict is that the last takes precedence. So here, the tag demo release is applied to the change set 7D8CC6072. It's that last one. That overrides the two tags of the same name above it. Now, the reason you would have the tag name written on multiple lines like this is that as the HG tags file is revised from change set to change set, you're not supposed to edit or remove any existing lines. You only edit the file by appending new lines. Otherwise, Mercurial can get confused about what tags are supposed to apply to what change sets. And this really is the most confusing aspect about tags. You would think, in a Mercurial command, when you specify some chain set by a tag name, a tag which is applied to that chain set, that Mercurial would look up the tag name in the current version of HG tags, that is, whatever version is currently in your working directory. But that's not how it works. The current set of tags in effect in your repository is not determined by whichever chain set you've updated to in your working directory. Rather, it is determined by the state of the HG tags file in the current head in the repository. And most confusingly, in the case where your repository has multiple heads at the moment, then the current set of tags is an amalgam of the content of HG tags in all of those heads. And this amalgamation of the HG tags files in the heads is similar to how a merge works, but not exactly the same. We won't go over the details here. Just remember that the odd thing about tags is that the current set of tags in effect is determined by not the content of .hg tags in your working directory, but rather by the heads in the repo. So in fact, this has the odd consequence that if you manually edit hg tags, if you append new lines, those tags won't be visible, they won't be known to the repo until you actually make a commit with those changes to .hg tags. 
Now, while you generally can get away with manually creating and editing the .hg tags files, usual practice is to create and edit the file indirectly by using the hg tag command, which does that for us. And the unintuitive thing about the hg tag command is that it not only appends a new line to .hg tags, but it then commits the file, because if it didn't, that new tag wouldn't be in effect. It would only be a line in the file. It wouldn't be a tag name you could actually use in your commands. Some people find this very objectionable about the tag system because it means anytime you make a new tag or modify an existing tag, a new change set is committed. And some people don't like how that clutters their version history and their repositories. Anyway, in demonstrating the tag command, we'll also use the tags command, note the difference, which doesn't actually create any tags or modify any existing tags. It simply just lists the set of tags currently in effect in your repository. So if you're wondering what tag refers to what revision currently, the tags command will tell you. You may have noticed in chain sets we've seen previously that some of them report a line that reads tag colon tip. Tip is a special tag which is always automatically set to refer to the tip chain set. That is the head in the repo with the highest revision number. That's always the tip. So here when I try to use the hg tag command to apply the tag tip to the current parent of the working directory, we get this error message saying abort the name tip is reserved. So we can't use tip as a tag name nor in fact as a bookmark name. Here though, I'm successfully invoking hd tag to apply the tag release space v3.4 to revision 359, and note that if I didn't specify revision number, it would default to the current parent of the working directory. Then immediately after the tag command, if we look at the log, you'll notice that it actually has created a new chain set, 360. So the tag command not only appended to .hd tags, it actually made a new commit. And now you can see below in chain set 359, it now has a tag release space v3.4. By the way, in the log command, we specified the option hyphen l space 2, meaning show just the last two revisions. If I didn't use that option and I just wrote hg log, it would print out all 361 chain sets. And then at the bottom here, we invoke hg tags to report what the current tags are. There's the tip, which will always be there. But also now it reports that the tag release space v3.4 applies to revision 359. Now, when using the hg tag command to modify an existing tag, that is to set the tag to refer to some other chain set rather than the one it currently refers to, you will get an error message saying that the tag of that name already exists. And if you really want to modify the tag, then you have to invoke tag with the f option, meaning force. The reason for this is really just to prevent you from accidentally modifying some existing tag. It's effectively asking for confirmation that, yeah, you know you're actually modifying some existing tag, not creating a new one. So both branch names and tags are simply tools for organizing your chain sets, for keeping track of things. Some people like to include them in their workflow, other people don't. Perhaps, though, the most important decision about your workflow is whether you choose to manage separate branches within the same repo or in separate repos. If you and your team decide not to separate branches out into separate repos, your workflow probably looks something like this. The team members each have all just their own one repository, and when it comes time to sync, they all go through a central repository. So any two changes between members are not exchanged directly between their repos, they're pushed up to the central repository where they can be pulled by the other users. When it comes time to work on a separate branch, the users just make those branches in the one repository they use, and they push them up to the central repository where they can be pulled down by the other members, just like they do with the mainline branch. So in this workflow, when you have separate open branches, that is branches that were created and yet haven't yet been merged in with mainline, then you're simply keeping around multiple heads in each repo. The alternative workflow, and the one perhaps more commonly used in Mercurial, is to keep separate branches in separate repositories. That is, when you decide, hey, I want to have a new branch here, first you clone off a new repository, and then you make the commits in that new repository. So, say, in this example, the four team members are pushing their separate branches of development into separate repositories. Bug fixes for existing features get pushed up to the bug fix repo, but work on some new feature X is pushed up to a separate repository. And then the changes in those repositories get pulled up into the dev repo, where the two branches get merged, and when it comes time to make a stable release, someone on the team pushes that stable version from the dev repo up to stable. Now, what's not pictured here is that the individual users, Mike, Gene, Alan, and Kim, 
they might keep their new feature work and their bug fix work in separate repositories as well. So they don't necessarily each have just one repository, they may have many, which act as their separate branches. That decision, though, can actually be left up to the individual users. So what you see here is actually just one variant of keeping branches in separate repos. There's tons of different ways you can go about it, and you don't have to take a pure approach. You can have some branches mixed together in the same repo, uh, and you can keep other branches separate in separate repos. Understand, though, that what it really means to keep a single branch in a single repository is that within that repository, you generally maintain just one head. The only time you have multiple heads is when you're just pulling in some other branch to merge in that repository. So having multiple heads in that repository is just a very temporary state while you do your merge. As soon as you keep around the multiple heads in the same repository, well, that one repo really no longer represents just one branch. Again, though, which style of workflow to use, that's a matter of preference. Some will argue very strongly for doing things one way, and then just as many people will argue for doing things the other way. The last thing we'll cover is that we've already seen some number of informative commands, that is commands which don't really modify the repo at all, they just uh, display information about the repo. We've seen hg status, we've seen hg log, we have hg parents, and hg tags, but there's also hg heads, diff, identity, tip, outgoing, incoming, and help. The heads command uh, simply displays the current heads in the repository, that is, all chain sets without any children. The diff command will print out a diff between the working directory and its parent, or between the working directory and some other chain set, or between any other two chain sets. The identity command prints out the ID, the chain set ID, of the working directory's parent, or any other chain set that you specify, uh, and what makes it more useful than the other commands which do the same thing is that ID can be used on remote repositories. So I can query another repository and ask it, say, what is the ID of the current head of such and such branch? That's the sort of thing you can do with identify. The tip command simply prints out the change set, which is the current tip in your repository. And then the outgoing and incoming commands, respectively, list the change sets which have yet to be pushed to another repository, or of which yet to be pulled from another repository. So if you want to know what change sets will get copied in a push or pull without actually doing the push or pull, you can use outgoing and incoming. And finally, the help command is effectively the manual for Mercurial. If you want to know more about a specific command, like say the diff command, you type hg help diff, and that reports the help on the diff command. So you'll probably end up using the help command quite a bit, especially early on. We'll end now by briefly going over a list of things we didn't cover about Mercurial. Uh, first off of which is network access. How do you make a repository accessible in the network, whether over SSH or HTTP? In practice, this is an important topic, but we won't go into it because it's quite involved. We also didn't discuss file path syntax, meaning when you specify a file path in a Mercurial command or in one of the config files, how does that match up with an actual file path? because Mercurial actually uses a pattern matching syntax very similar to the regex syntax used by the uh, unix find command. So for example, if I want to add to the working directory manifest all files ending in .zip, uh, there is a syntax I can use to specify all files ending in .zip without having to specify them all by name. This file matching syntax is used not just in commands, but also in this file called .hgignore, which is a file in your .hg directory which lists files in your working directory which Mercurial should ignore. It's quite common in your working directory to have a number of files which you need to be there, but you don't want to have them version tracked. Like for example, when you build your project, you may end up with a bunch of compiled code files in your working directory, but you don't want those version tracked. You only want your source files tracked. And while it's the case that Mercurial will not track files, which you don't explicitly add uh, with the hgadd command, it becomes really bothersome to have all these files in your working directory which still show up, say, in an hg status command. They'll show up with a question mark, meaning that it's present in the working directory, but is not included in the manifest. The files can also be bothersome because it's quite easy to add them on accident. In fact, if you invoke hg add without any arguments, as we saw, it will actually add all files in the working directory that aren't currently tracked. So to make sure that doesn't happen, and to stop these files from being listed in hg status, uh, you'll want to add them to the .hgignore file. Now, we did discuss how when you create new files in your working directory, and when you remove them from wor your working directory, you want to tell Mercurial about those new and removed files with the hgadd command and the hgremove command. For similar reasons, when you rename a file or move a file uh, within the working directory, 
or when you copy a file in the working directory, that is, you place in the working directory a copy of some other file that's already included. In these cases, you'll want to tell Mercurial that, hey, these aren't new files, these are actually just copies or renames of existing files in the repo. Doing so helps Mercurial track the revision history of those files more intelligently. For example, if you have some file in the early change sets of your repository where the file was named foo, but then in later change sets you've renamed it to bar, you want Mercurial to know that foo and those earlier change sets are really just earlier versions of the same file named bar in the later change sets. If Mercurial is told about that relationship, it can do intelligent things like, say, identify a common ancestor in a merge even when the file has been renamed since the common ancestor. So briefly, the takeaway here is when it comes time to rename or copy files within your working directory, you'll want to use the Mercurial commands for doing so, just like when you remove a file with hg remove. What are called bookmarks in Mercurial are Mercurial's semi-equivalent of what in Git are called refs. A ref is basically just some named pointer to a change set, quite like a tag, but without the weird business of being stored in a file that's kept in, in the revision history. And also, refs are only used to point to head change sets, and have the special property that when a new revision is made on top of that head, the ref is moved with it to that new change set. So that's the gist of how refs work, and bookmarks are basically just Mercurial's equivalent of refs. A hook in a version control system refers to an optional script which is executed when users perform certain actions in the repository. Like, for example, you can configure a hook in your repository to execute every time someone makes a commit. And, in fact, you can have the hook potentially reject the commit, refuse to let the commit go through if it fails to meet some criteria as determined by the hook. So, for example, you might set up your hook script to first run the unit tests of your code, and if the unit tests fail, then the commit is rejected. Basically, it's a strategy to prevent people from committing code with obvious bugs in it. That, though, is just one common use of hooks. There are others that we won't get into. We discussed earlier how binary files don't diff very well. So the problem then becomes in a distributed version control system that if your project has lots of large binary files that go through many versions, then the size of this repository, which you're cloning out to all your users and, and cloning to make branches of and so forth, is going to be problematically large. A solution to this problem in Mercurial is to use an extension called large files, which enables you to mark certain files as binary files which only gets stored in some central repository. So if you modify one of these files and then make a new change set, the change set only has a marker indicating of, hey, this is where you go find this file if you actually want it. The file itself doesn't get stored in the repo. So you would typically give this treatment to the large binary files in your project. Like, say, if you're working on a game and you have gigabytes or maybe even terabytes of art assets that you need to store somewhere on the central repository, but you don't want copied around with every clone of your repository. Lastly, if you ever need to work with a Git repository or a Subversion repository, it's possible to do so from Mercurial. There's an extension for interoperating with Git and an extension for interoperating with Subversion. For all the basics, interoperating with Git especially is pretty trivial because Git structurally is very, very similar. In some cases, though, you have feature mismatches. You have semantic differences between Mercurial repositories and Git and Subversion repositories, especially in the case of Subversion because the structure of Subversion is that of a centralized version control system.